if you were stuck on a deserted island, what would be the one thing that you would get rid of? Ooh. Oh, that is a very interesting question. Uh, well, you know, I have this band that I'm not very fond of, so I guess I'd get rid of that. <laughs> okay, what's the band? Oh, you know, it's just like this little metal ring. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, how about you? If, if you um, were stuck on a deserted island, what would you get rid of? My sense of decorum. No more manners. I'm not being polite at all. Forget about it. I'm eating with my hands the whole time. Elbows on my eating rock, because I probably won't have a table. Right. You know what I mean? All yeah. of that stuff. No, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Wear my pajamas all day long. Who cares? My pajamas yeah. are probably my day wear anyway. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I would do. Just... Decorum. Out the window. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Wolfle Wednesdays. Nathan reads a series of unfortunate events. Ignore the tattoo. My name is Nathan. And I'm Tyler. Um, if you are new to this, then we are reading through all of the books in a series of unfortunate events. And we are now on book the 13th, The End. Mm -hmm. um, and we are specifically looking at chapters one to four. We've been reading through all of the books in the series and uh, each book it gets split up into three different parts. So we make three videos and then we release them weekly, chapters one to four, five to eight, and then nine to 13. Like I say, we are looking at chapters one to four with the last book in the series. We've made it. Right, yeah. And um, uh, we should mention that since there is chapter 14, right, um, which is uh, labeled as book the last, mm -hmm. um, but it is within book the 13th, then um, that will be covered uh, on a separate discussion as part of our wrap up. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And I would, yeah, yeah, I think that covers it. Um, and I, I guess I should add that you have read the series before a couple times. I'm mm -hmm. reading it for the first time. All right. So we do have a sponsor for this week's podcast. So our sponsor is The Moral Compass. Now, Snicket says that you can't find a moral compass, but you actually can. From the makers of Magic 8-Ball, they now have the moral compass. Basically, it looks just like a compass, except what you do is you just spin the dial. You just give it a flick, and then it spins around. So if you are feeling like you are in some kind of moral conundrum and you don't quite know what to do, just get out your trusty moral compass, and you just give it a spin, and your options are, is this Im immoral? Yes, no, maybe, who cares? <laughs> that sounds great. That is almost, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to get one of those, put it right next to, right between my magic eight ball and my jump to conclusions mat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is honestly a great product. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. People could justify all kinds of decisions with this. They could just say, you know, well, I asked my moral compass and it said it's not immoral. So you can't right. get mad at me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well put. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. I hope you enjoy. Ignore the tattoo! Nathan unfortunately reads a series of unfortunate events. At an unfortunate age, which in this case is being used to indicate that he is entirely too old to be reading this for the first time. Alright, so we are looking at The End, book the 13th, uh, chapters 1 to 4. And Tyler, you have got plot summary duty for the week. Yeah, so uh, we pick up right where we left off with the Baudelaire's uh, on board... Uh, a ship called the Carmelita uh, right. with Count Olaf. Count Olaf quickly renames the boat to uh, Count Olaf. <laughs> yes, appropriately enough. Yep. Uh, and so they are surviving on beans in this boat, sailing through the ocean to, you know, no end, seemingly. Um, Can you help me out with this? Why are they sailing in the ocean going nowhere? Why don't they just sail down the coastline and go to some other town? That's a good question, and I do not really have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading it going, they're in the middle of the ocean. Why did they sail that way? Mm -hmm. Surely this thing had a rudder. Right. Uh, yeah. 
And, Sorry, uh, I shouldn't have no, brought no that worries. up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's it, it is a good question, um, but it doesn't matter anyway. They get caught in a storm. Uh, Count Olaf goes flying off of the boat. Not that it really matters. They all wind up on this coastal shelf um, mm. uh, on the edge of uh, an island where uh, they meet a girl named Friday, uh, who is named after a character from Robinson Crusoe. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, Friday determines that Count Olaf is not a nice person, so she leaves him there, but the Baudelaire's uh, come back to the island with Friday. I mean, he does threaten to shoot her with a harpoon gun, so yeah. I think she probably reached the right conclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't it's mean just, to suggest otherwise. No, it just it sounded like she just kind of intuited that he's a bad person, <laughs> but it's like he literally just threatened to shoot her with a harpoon gun, so <laughs> yes. I don't think there was much guessing involved. <laughs> right. Um... Yeah, so the Baudelaire's uh, find out that once a year there is this ceremony where, you know, whoever wants to leave the island can leave because the water raises up um, high enough that the coastal shelf is then flooded and then they, uh, or anybody who wants to leave can leave. Um, but nobody ever really seems to leave. Everybody is happy here living on uh, coconut cordial and... Uh, <laughs> yep. Yes. And um, uh, and following a man named Ish or Ishmael, right. um, who seems to be guilting them into uh, like guilting all of the residents of this island into just going along with whatever he wants. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so anytime they scavenge things off of the coastal shelf all the time, uh, anytime that there's a storm. But uh, they don't really use much of it, by which I mean practically any of it, because Ishmael always says, well, I won't force you to throw it away, but uh, I don't think that we have much use for it. And then people are like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> and then yeah, they just go he, along with it. Yeah, he, he kind of, he's essentially acting like a Jewish mother. Right. right. Yes. <laughs> it's just making them feel guilty if they do want to keep it. It's like, oh, that's the kind of thing that you think you would need. Okay. Right. That's that's yep. just what you need in your life. And it's like, fine. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and so I think uh, that's about it. But Ishmael, uh, he does not walk around. He uh, is he is using some magic clay in order to heal his mm -hmm. injured feet. Um, and, uh, and everybody on the island just goes along with this. Um, and he also somehow knows that the Baudelaire's are orphans, even though they did not say anything about that. Yeah. Um, I, okay. I, I just want to double check something here, but I think that it's relevant since we're on this topic and I didn't make a note of it. Uh, but so he's sitting on this throne that's made of clay but he's got his feet in the clay is that right yes yeah. um <laughs> do you think i imagine that this is supposed to be a reference to the phrase feet of clay right he's got feet of clay do you know what i'm talking about no i'm not familiar with that expression oh it means somebody who looks really strong and powerful but it's an illusion like, okay. they're not nearly as strong and, or, or powerful as it seems. That it's, like, basically just kick their feet because they're going to crumble. It's just made of clay. The rest right. of them might be made out of steel or iron, right? Like, essentially a statue. But it's, like, but its feet are made of clay. That right. it's, like, it doesn't have a strong foundation. But it it's kind of like Paper Tiger, right? It looks a lot more powerful. Like, it looks powerful, but it's actually not. It'll crumble very easily. So I mm -hmm. feel like that's kind of a commentary on his... Um, leadership position. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a great comment. I, yeah, because I did not uh, pick up on that, obviously, since I wasn't aware of the expression, but I definitely think that that is uh, what uh, Snicket or Handler is doing there. Yeah, and this these chapters in particular, I find, are really good representations of what postmodern literature is, and specifically 
pastiche because pastiche mm. is an element of postmodern literature. There are so many allusions to things, <laughs> yes. but yeah. seemingly for no reason. It's right. just like, hey, <laughs> that's a literary reference. And it's like, okay, why did you bring that up? What does that have to do with your plot or with your themes or significance with insight into the character? And it's like, nothing. Just they're on an island. So <laughs> Robinson Crusoe references. And it's right. like, you know, Moby Dick references, Heart of Darkness references. Like, let's just throw out a whole bunch of different references. It's like, but why? And it's like, because. Yeah. <laughs> there's, just, it, there's a lot of that in these um, four chapters, I noticed. And so if you enjoy that particular um, approach to literature, then you loved these chapters, I'm sure. And if you're not a huge fan like me, then <laughs> maybe not so much. I don't have an issue, actually. I, I think there's a, a fair bit that's pretty interesting within these chapters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that is a good way to uh, preface this, though. Um, and uh, yeah, all right. Uh, I guess, did you want to hop into it with your notes on chapter one? Sure. I've just got one. It's on page 18. It's referring to the moral compass, which we're thankful to have as a sponsor. Mm -hmm. So I guess let me go towards like maybe like a third of the way down the page where it says some believe that everyone is, bo is born with a moral compass already inside them, like an appendix or a fear of worms. Others believe that a moral compass develops over time as a person learns about the decisions of others by observing the world and reading books. In any case, a moral compass appears to be a delicate device, and as people grow older and venture out into the world, it often becomes more and more difficult to figure out which direction one's moral compass is pointing, so it is harder and harder to figure out the proper thing to do. Um, this is definitely... It, he is engaging in a big concept here. So the concept is, is a sense of morality innate to us, or is it all culturally constructed? Right. Right. That's the debate that he's engaging in. And yeah. I like the fact that he doesn't settle it. He's not taking a position. He's just saying, hey, people are kind of confused by this. And I, yeah. I wish he would do that more often. Because right. so often he just introduces it. He simplifies it. He makes it into a... And he often misdefines it and mm -hmm. makes it really far more simplistic than it actually is. But in this case, just saying these are kind of two major positions and it's up to you to kind of figure out um, which one you believe. But where I take issue is where he says that as people grow older and venture out into the world, it often becomes more and more difficult to figure out which direction one's moral compass is pointing. So it's harder and harder to figure out the proper thing to do. Um, to me, this sounds like the it's this moral ambiguity that I think people who do not have a religious background and are not devout, something that they experience, but people who become more and more devout as they get older or who take their faith quite seriously throughout their life, whatever religion happens to be, I don't think that comes up. I think yeah. people seem to have at least in my experience, not just people that I know personally, but the the insight that you hear from older people who have studied a particular holy text for their entire life, they seem less confused about the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. It tends yeah. to be younger people who really struggle through it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I would agree. Um, yeah, I, I, I know. I, I do like that he brings up you know, the different ways that you can interpret a moral compass. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't really work to say that, you know, it gets harder as you get older. It's like, don't you have more life experience yeah. and, you know, a better understanding of what works and what doesn't? And, you know, I don't know how people will react to things. So yeah, maybe I'm yeah. wrong in even saying that religious people <laughs> versus secular humanists, um, you know, or atheists or agnostics, like, I just... Yeah, because I don't even know if that's exactly true. It mm. just seems like the older people get, the more they've at least got it figured out in their head, whether you agree with them or not. But they right. seem less confused over their own sense of morality. Mm -hmm. So, 
I, I kind of feel sorry for Snicket, let's say. Right. Potentially for Handler, if that's the case. It's like, you're getting more confused as you get older? Like, that sounds yeah. awful. I'm getting yeah. less confused. <laughs> <laughs> and it's delightful it's wonderful i'm like this is so much better right. <laughs> i'm not tormented by is this the right thing is that the right thing yeah yeah i mean i guess part of it could be because he is speaking to you know uh middle age or yeah, middle school middle, middle uh, grade middle readers grade, thank you yeah, yeah that as they you know go through puberty then things sure get the teen years are gonna get real confusing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true because things do make a lot of sense when you're a kid but then they get super confusing for the teenage years right and they kind of work themselves out in like the, your 20s moving into your 30s at least in my experience right that i look back <laughs> on it and i go yep that's when i was the most confused <laughs> <laughs> yeah um that's right. a fair so, point, though. I appreciate that, Tyler. Um, but yeah, that's all that I had with chapter one. Okay. Uh, I only had one note, which is uh, Sunny's comment on page three, where she says, Subis, um, uh, when she is serving food. Um, and that is, uh, of course, because Snicket had written about onions so much prior, mm -hmm. uh, then Subis is a type of onion sauce. Oh, Okay. So, yeah, it, it's a fun little uh, connection there, and I don't have much else to say other than, oh, well done. <laughs> but of course, you know, a food reference would, uh, you know, it would happen. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, all right, well, that's great. Why don't you keep going with chapter two? All right. Um, all right, on page 38, um, then... Snicket gives this, uh, you know, long description of, um, of, you know, an instance when he was speaking to the Baudelaire's mother. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just read from the top of the page. Uh, when you find yourself tongue-tied in front of someone you do not know, you might want to remember something the Baudelaire's mother told them long ago and something she told me even longer ago. I can see her now sitting on a small couch she used to keep in the corner of her bedroom, adjusting the straps on her sandals with one hand and munching on an apple with the other, telling me not to worry about the party that was beginning downstairs. People love to talk about themselves, Mr. Snicket, she said to me between bites of apple. If you find yourself wondering what to say to any of the guests, ask them which secret code they prefer or find out whom they've been spying on lately. Um, yeah, so this is interesting because uh it's revealing that snicket is very uh reclusive that he's mm. you know he, he doesn't do well in social situations mm. um uh and that he needed to get you know some encouragement from the Baudelaire's mother uh but also the reference to the sandals uh as well as the apple mm -hmm. um which both come up in this story then it seems very unusual to uh to have those connections for you know for seemingly no reason <laughs> because yes. she's not on the island uh it says you know that she had a small couch in the corner of her bedroom mm -hmm. so yeah it definitely <laughs> seems significant this yeah. reference to an apple and her eating it um and i want to discuss this but later on um in chapter four specifically then i want to bring this up okay um yeah and then i also uh i do really like the uh the statement there people love to talk about themselves mm -hmm. um which is so true <laughs> it's great advice um a, a lot of people like have said to me i mean i i don't know Okay, this is basically how I discovered this, but not even so much discovered it. It's just that a lot of people have said to me, they're like, wow, you're so good at, you know, meeting new people and having engaging conversations with somebody you've never met before, and you're just good at it. And um, I realized they're like, I, I realized what it is, though. It's just that I'm genuinely interested in people. And so I just right. ask a lot of questions. And I, I just like very specific questions and I just keep asking, not in a rude or an uh, interrogative way, 
you know what I mean, where I'm trying to interrogate them, you know what I mean? But I just, I'm genuinely curious and trying to find things that are interesting about that person and connections that I can make. But then I did realize, uh, oh, that's what you do to get people to talk. Just get them to talk about themselves and they'll right. go on and on and on. And then afterwards, then they'll feel like, boy, I really liked that person. They were great. And it's like, you only liked them because they were interested in you. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it's just, it's one of those things that it's, it's absolutely true. I have the same note of just like, yes, this is true. This is very good advice. It's not, yeah. to me, it's not that difficult. Sometimes if you're interacting with somebody who's not particularly skilled in social settings, then what will happen is they maybe don't like talking about themselves. So they clam up. Right. And that's where it kind of goes wrong. But for the most part, people really do like talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I've gotten that advice, you know, when searching for jobs um, or even like when I was in school, then it's like, well, interview, you know, other people who are in your field, like people who already have jobs that you want then sit down and talk with them. Yeah. They will be happy to because they just get to talk about themselves. <laughs> it's true. No, yeah, yeah. doing, uh, I forget, what is, what is it that they call that type of interview? Oh, uh, I don't remember now. Um, but yeah, no, it is, it, it's good advice, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, I have one other note for chapter two, which is on page 40. Um, and this is when Olaf has claimed the island uh, as his own, calling it Olaf land. Um, and then he refers to, you know, the people who live there as <coughs> primitive people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't even see any houses on the island. Uh, and all of this, uh, it's, it's very uh, evocative of, you know, how humans have historically traveled to new places and then immediately assumed that just because you know people don't uh, the the people there don't uh you know have the same lifestyle mm -hmm. as the travelers then they are primitive um, certainly europeans right <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah i would say not so much maybe not so much humans but europeans when they have traveled to new places then right. they just make that judgment of well, their buildings are not as permanent as ours. Therefore, yeah. <laughs> they're less developed in terms of their civilization, which is like, that's a pretty snap judgment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's one of those things that's kind of funny. It's like, you know, we advance technologically as a civilization and like the it's the wealthiest, most privileged people who are then like, I'm going to go camping and live in a tent for a week. <laughs> Do you know right. what I mean? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, All right. But yeah, that, that was my only other note for the chapter. Okay. Um, I've got a note at the beginning. So it goes from page 24 over to 27. I don't think there's really much point in going through this um, in too much detail. But at the top of 24, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, he says... Um, so it's useless for me to describe the force of the wind that tore through the sails as if they were paper and sent the boat spinning like an ice skater showing off. It is impossible for me to convey the volume of rain that fell, drenching the boat layers and freezing water so their concierge uniforms clung to them like an extra layer of soaked and icy skin. So it just goes on for four pages. And yeah. what this is, is he is dramatizing the action by not dramatizing it. Mm -hmm. And... He does this all the time. I've said this yes. before that he's there's no instances like or very, very few in these books where he dramatizes the action in any, um, I don't know, effective way. Mm, right. He's not good at describing action or plot. Yeah. It's always he's removed from it but then yeah. also describing it. It's, well, I can't possibly describe it. And it's kind of excusing the fact that it's not a great description, but then mm. he's still describing it. It's like, are you just, is it Handler or is it Snicket, right? Is right. it that yeah. Snicket is just such a terrible writer that he doesn't know how to dramatize action? Or is it that Handler doesn't, so then he's come up with this entire 
you know, <laughs> pretense to be able to, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a good point and a good question. And I know I, I, I did pick up on that. And then we have another long section later on where it just goes on and on. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> it's unpleasant but, to read. It's not fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so it just, it happens so often. And I just think this is a really good example. If you're going to point to an example, that would be a really good example from the series to say, this is my issue with the way he dramatizes action. Gotcha. I think that it actually works fairly well here, but I, I do admit that, you know, oftentimes and it doesn't. It's that when do we ever get good action descriptions? Right. <laughs> like ever. Yeah. And so anyway, um, we'll move on. Okay, so we've already talked about the people love to talk about themselves on page 38. On page 39, then the girl who introduces herself, then she says that her name is Friday. And of course, in Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe, then, um, you know, that he meets a native of the island and then mm-hmm. names him Friday. I believe it's because he landed on the island or he met him on Good Friday. Oh, I didn't know that it was Good Friday. I just knew that it was a Friday. <laughs> I feel like it was Good Friday. Um, okay. I haven't, I've only read excerpts from Robinson Crusoe. So mm-hmm. anyway, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. But I wonder too if it's supposed to be another little reference to the, like to the Howard Hawks film, His Girl Friday. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering about that as well. Uh, and we definitely get one of those references later on when, um, uh, when Sonny says Gal Friday. Yeah, exactly. Which I think is a more direct uh, yeah. reference. Yeah, I think Cary Grant is in the movie. I'm pretty sure it's Cary Grant. And um, anyway, but it's a Howard Hawks film. And it's like a screwball comedy. So I'm like, <laughs> so Robinson Crusoe and a screwball comedy from the 30s. I'm pretty sure it's from the 30s. Uh, what's the connection between them? What's the significance? It's just connections significance right. <laughs> illusions yes <laughs> and we then get this on page 49 where you have the reference to moby dick right where the guy says um call me ish right yes. i don't know if that he says it there but basically ishmael who's on the island and ishmael is the narrator and our protagonist in moby dick mm-hmm. and then also on that page then it says, and that's the bottom of the, the first paragraph on page 49. It says, Ishmael can't even stand, but he serves as the island's facilitator. So that kind of connects to what I was saying before about, you know, feet made of clay. And then D. Mark, Sonny asked Klaus, a facilitator is someone who helps other people make decisions. The middle Baudelaire explained. Friday nodded in agreement. Ishmael decides what detritus might be of use to us and what the sheep should drag away. To D. Mark, to like that demarcation of this is useful this is not useful right so yeah, yeah. i think that's what sunny why she says demark like that yeah, yeah. And... i was thinking the same thing uh and by the way we have hopped into uh chapter three now oh i apologize i wasn't paying close attention yeah no worries <laughs> we're in chapter th- okay gotcha i did jump ahead um do you want me to keep going uh sure all right, on page 62, I think I'm still in chapter three. Uh, yep. Yeah, I am. Uh, this is my last note for chapter three. On page 62, at the top of the page, you've got this super weird thing going on where Ishmael is, um, through peer pressure, encouraging everyone to be drunk all the time, essentially. Right. <laughs> at least buzzed. Um, I don't yeah. know, because that's all they drink is this fermented... What is it? A fermented coconut concoction? I believe so. Yeah. (laughs) And he says, I won't force you, Ishmael said again, but your initial opinion on just about anything may change over time. See you soon, Baudelaire's. So it's an interesting comment. I I honestly don't know what to make of the fact that he's encouraging them to drink. Um, Not only are they underage, but it just seems like a terrible idea. It's like, if that's all they drink, how are they still alive? Yeah, because it dehydrates you. You need to have actual water. Like, that's my point. It's not even so much like, oh, you just like you'd be actually drunk or alcohol poisoning. It's like, well, if you're not having huge amounts, you'd be fine, but you'd never actually get sufficient amounts of water. 
Yeah, I'm not sure like how strong it is supposed to be, but it's certainly too strong for the Baudelaire's. Um, and yeah, I don't know because it is like coconut water or coconut milk or whatever you want to call it uh, is, I understand, good and healthy and all that. Oh, it's great. But, uh, you know, once you ferment, ferment it, ferment it, yeah. Yeah. How long are you fermenting it for? How much, you know, <laughs> what is the alcohol content here? <laughs> yeah, that actually matters because I'm pretty sure if it's over something like 3%, then the amount of alcohol dehydrates you more than whatever water is in the alcoholic beverage that's hydrating you. So, okay. but if it's under 3%, then you do actually get a net hydration effect. So when gotcha. people say, oh, don't drink alcohol because it's going to dehydrate you. And you could say, this is only like, whatever, let's say you have a beer and you water it down enough. I don't know, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Where it ends up being less than 3% overall, then you'll still actually get hydration effects. So, yep. <laughs> but this comment that um, your initial opinion on just about anything may change over time, so you assume mm -hmm. Baudelaire's, that it's an interesting comment on alcohol because that is certainly true for most people. The first time that they try alcohol, it doesn't taste good. And yeah. then usually through peer pressure and, uh, you know, kind of a, a move towards being mature, right? Then it's like, I don't really like the taste, but I'm going to acquire a taste for this. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> so, and that's okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I, uh, I was just going to say that I think that it is interesting that Ishmael would say this when their initial reaction of him is, oh, he seems quite cordial and, you know, friendly and all that. Yes. It's like, you know, oh, because your your opinion of something, um, uh, your your initial opinion on just about anything may change over time. He doesn't say that it'll, you know, that you'll start to like it better no. or that you'll start to like it less, but right. just that it'll change over time. And so, yeah, I, I think that it's uh, a really interesting line, but certainly in regards to alcohol you are uh yeah yes like and i think that there's a lot of things like that that kids encounter as they become teenagers and then as they become young adults where they you're going to encounter things of the adult world that often are not very pleasant the first time you encounter them but then over time it changes like, mm -hmm. there's just so many different examples of it. Uh, I don't know that there's even, you know, much point in going through example after example. But there's just, yeah. there's a whole bunch where the first time, and usually, I mean, that tends to be the thing anyway, is that when we're doing something for the first time, then we're typically not very good at it. And right. so it's uncomfortable and it's more difficult to do. Like something as simple as driving, you know, learning to drive mm -hmm. a car can be kind of scary and stressful because you're not good at it. You, you, you know, push on the brake and you lurch forward and you're like, <laughs> right. this is stupid. And then over time, <laughs> then it becomes a really enjoyable activity for most yeah. people, right? That like right. they tend to enjoy driving more as it becomes more fluid for them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's an interesting comment, but then there's also all this stuff that stuff that you enjoyed as a kid, your opinion about it changes over time as you get older. So you used to really enjoy it. And then as you right. get older, it just doesn't have the same effect anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, it functions well with these books being coming of age stories. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that is a, that's a great comment there. Um, all right. So that's just, all that I had for chapter three. So go ahead. All right. Uh, yeah. My first note is on page 46. Um, this is the whole discussion of homonyms, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's interesting that he doesn't actually say homonyms at any point. I'm like, that's what they are. Just <laughs> yeah, it is surprising. But it's also a kind of a snicket thing of even yeah. when he knows what he's talking about, then he isn't super educated on the topic. I'm right. not saying handler. I'm saying snicket. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't know about you, but I thought about this uh, sentence that he gives. The bears bear hard, hard yarn yarns. And I think that it can actually have a meaning. <laughs> I think so, too. 
Because I'm like, it initially you look at it and you're just like, this is nonsense. And then you're like, wait, I think maybe. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. the bears struggle through very difficult and tough, like dense yarn mm. stories. Stories yes. about yarn. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it works. <laughs> yep. So it's, I'm just like, it. I'm impressed by that. I'm like, wow, that that is difficult to come up with a, a, a sentence where six out of seven words are homonyms and it yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah. If that's kind of what you enjoy, and I know that you definitely enjoy that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then it's a good example of it. It's, it's very well done. Yep. <laughs> um, all right. Next note is on page uh, 53. Um, and this is, uh, I'm trying to figure out where to start with this. Um, uh, uh, I will start with the, uh, last sentence of the top paragraph there. Uh, Violet, Klaus, and Sonny were not sure how Friday would react if they admitted being in the villain's company and they did not reply for a moment until the mill Baudelaire remembered an expression he had read in a novel about people who were very, very polite. It depends on how you look at it, Klaus said, using a phrase which sounds like an answer, but scarcely means anything at all. Um, and I just, I like that because, yeah, that is, you know, how it is so often used, where it's just like, you know, I don't want to answer, but, you know, this will make it seem like I'm answering. <laughs> yeah, and there's there's been a lot of that in the last few books, like certainly in the last book, when they were not mm -hmm. sure if they were talking to Frank or Ernest. Then they yeah. kept answering in ways that are essentially meaningless. And I feel like it's in part a commentary on how to be more grown up, how to be right. like an adult in small talk. <laughs> right? Yeah. That there's just a lot of meaningless things that we say, you know, with people in the workplace and strangers we encounter where it's just like, don't say anything of substance, but you need to say something. Right. Yeah. Because. <laughs> You don't want to burden somebody with the truth. So, but you also don't want to lie. So you just say these meaningless phrases and everybody, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm grateful that that person just gave me a meaningless phrase. Now I don't have to engage. Just Absolutely. say, Absolutely. well, that's right. Mm -hmm. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. Meaningless. <laughs> Completely Absolutely. empty. How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you? <laughs> like, it's just, you don't yeah. think about it. You're, you're Fridays, like... huh? Oh, you're telling me. Looking forward to the weekend? You know it. All right, take care. You too. Bye-bye. Right? Hey, yep. That was just what a waste of a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right, and my last note for this chapter is on page uh, 63. Um, when uh, the Baudelaire's, uh, this is around the middle of that uh, main paragraph, uh, the Baudelaire's felt strange to don the garments of Shibboleth, a phrase which here means uh, wear the warm and somewhat unflattering clothing that was customary to the people they hardly knew. Um, so they are casting away their old clothing, um, which in and of itself is interesting that he doesn't, you know, phrase it that way. Mm. Um, but then also Shibboleth, I did look it up uh, here is um is a like its origins is in uh the biblical book of judges um which uh uh basically it is a um uh it's any custom or tradition usually a choice of phrasing or even a single word that distinguishes one group of people from another um so it's uh yeah, it's interesting that he's using this. Uh, certainly it makes sense with his uh, Jewish heritage to be familiar with the term shibboleth. Um, but I'm not quite sure, like, how it works here, um, where it's just, I guess they're abandoning, they're casting away clothes of one custom in order to embrace uh, another. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's such an interesting choice of word, though. <laughs> it is, but I think it is appropriate, at least to some degree, uh, when we get into chapter four and my comments mm. with that. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, right. 
Um, all right. So I guess, uh, did you want me to uh, continue on in chapter sure. four? Sure. All uh, right. Uh, and I think, yeah, I only have two notes here. Uh, the first note is on page 71. Um, uh, yeah, this is the Pyrrhonic, uh, Sonny said, mm -hmm. um, which is a reference to Pyrrho, um, who was a, um, a, I believe, Greek. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> now, I'm, now I've lost it. But It is Greek. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, who was a skeptic? He really uh, embraced uh, the scientific method, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so doubted things such as magic or um, intuition, I suppose, as right. it's being used here. Right. Um, and uh, oh, my last note is so simple. It is um, on the runcible spoons as mentioned on page 87 <laughs> um, which i didn't I, I didn't really realize before reading these books that uh a spork had another name <laughs> really <laughs> yeah i didn't know that <laughs> that's what it is apparently i thought it was just spoon was the other name <laughs> yep no apparently it's um yeah runcible a runcible spoon <laughs> is runcible a spork <laughs> interesting okay <laughs> so i know uh, that my notes weren't of much substance but i know that you are probably going to be speaking about cults and all that with your notes <laughs> um not exactly cults interesting well i mean to some degree yes yeah. so i guess i might as well get into that so this is on page 79 then mm -hmm. at the top of the page i guess i might as well go from the bottom of 78 to to begin with the the sentence there it says uh mr pitt cairn took the top of a chest of drawers to the arboretum followed by miss marlowe who had the bottom of a barrel dr kurtz threw out a silver tray and then it continues on from there i don't know if you recognize the names marlowe and kurtz nope um so that's from heart of darkness joseph uh conrad's novella it's not really a novel but novella from Ooh, I'm, I'm kind of putting myself on the spot. I want to say 1890, 1891, somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, very, very significant piece of literature. And um, it ended up getting a, kind of loosely adapted into Apocalypse Now, the mm. Francis Ford Coppola film um, about the Vietnam War, but it's not about the Vietnam War. But Heart of Darkness is incredibly significant um, as a piece of literature. And it's basically, you've got... Um, it's been a while since I've read it, but uh, I just don't want to get mixed up on the names, but I believe that it's Kurtz who he takes over this particular village in the heart of Africa. He's British and it's, you know, with the exploitation of Africa with imperialism and um, all of that in the 19th century, the way the Europeans carved up Africa and, you know, gave artificial borders that they just arbitrarily decide, decided at the Berlin conference, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Kurtz goes there and for lack of a better phrase, because it's, it's, it's not a great phrase, but he goes native, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, he, but he becomes their occult like leader of this village. And it's the question of how can this civilized British man become uncivilized and become like these savages and these uncivilized people, you know, getting deeper and deeper into the heart of Africa. And it's basically, there's something in the human spirit that as you get um, removed from civilization, that, that um, essentialist animalistic part of you, like the beating of the heart of, of the darkness comes upon you. Mm. And he, um, and kind of recognizes his own ugliness and darkness within himself. And, you know, his famous last words is the horror, the horror. And it's right. like, what does that mean? Right. And yeah. all of this. And so it's a very significant piece of literature, which has been studied. I don't want to say to death, um, but it's one of the most studied pieces of literature in the last 150 years. So 
it's very much on this island. It's playing off of the the theme of Heart of Darkness. They're removed from society, and then you've got this character. Um, what is his name? Uh, sorry, Ishmael. Yeah, Ishmael. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ishmael is. Ish. <laughs> yeah, Ish is very much acting like a Kurtz like character. Um, and then Marlo within Heart of Darkness, he travels down uh, into the heart of Africa to go and find out what happened to Kurtz because nobody actually knows. And then he's completely, um, uh, he's really terrified by what he finds, by the fact that somebody who's just the peak of civilization, because Great Britain in the late 19th century, I mean, the sun never set on the British Empire, like literally because they own so much territory um, through imperialism and colonialism that it was just the world's biggest empire ever and that somebody who's a product of that with the best education and everything else that he could reject civilization so to speak um mm -hmm. and what is it specifically that causes that but that's what's happening here is they're rejecting a lot of stuff from civilization so he's nice. playing off of heart of darkness but he's doing other stuff here too so mm. If you look at the illustration that um, uh, Hellquist, Brett Hellquist, gives us at the beginning of chapter four on page 69, then this is the image itself is saturated with Christian iconography. It is just completely saturated with with. Um, Christian iconography. So you've got the one, uh, first of all, they're wearing robes and, you know, they're barefoot. And so we often think about um, the apostles and Jesus as being in, you know, robes, wearing sandals, right? So you've got that, first of all. Then you've got the one guy who's holding up a window, which very much could be a stained glass window. We right. don't have, you know, so it's representative of a church. Um, I don't know what to make of. I'm pretty sure that that's Violet or somebody who's holding. Who's that? Who's holding the typewriter? Uh, that's a good question, and I know that it. Uh, Snicket definitely gives her a name, but I don't. I feel like remember. that can't be Violet because she no. looks too young. It might have been Ariel or. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of the typewriter, but then you've got that one person. I've kind of got an idea about the typewriter, but it's not as significant as the other ones. But then you have this person holding one way, which is very much New Testament theology, like New Covenant theology. There is only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. You then have the fish. And so the fish is representative in many ways of Jesus with his ministry, with feeding people with the fish, but also um, the ichthys, which is the, you know, the Jesus fish is how mm -hmm. people often think of it, but it's called yeah. the ichthys, which is what early Christians used in the early uh, church in Rome, where it was a secret symbol that they would, you would draw it with your foot in the sand to determine if, so you meet somebody and it's just, you know, like they didn't really have, a, they had obviously like um, some like cobblestone streets and things like that, but often you're on an unpaved road. And so you would just, you're talking to a person and it was dangerous to be a Christian. So one thing that you would do then is you would just kind of casually with your foot, just draw a little fish and the person would kind of look and you, and then if they're a Christian too, they go, ah, so they would draw it back. Right. But it's kind right. of a way of showing, are you a Christian without saying it directly? Cause you don't want to get in trouble. And then, you know, they would have that for church and stuff like that, where they would put up a little ichthys symbol so that's what it means when people see the the jesus fish and they often think you're throwing my religion in you know like your religion in my face and it's like well it does go back to the early history of the church which is uh no it's kind of a signal to other christians of we're persecuted people don't necessarily like us and i'm trying to be subtle even though it's not subtle <laughs> right but it's right. more subtle than a cross but anyway so you've got the the fish which can be representative of the ichthys the one character definitely looks like a medieval monk the top of their head looks like they don't have hair but then they've got hair um underneath do you know Ooh. what you see that yeah in between the fish and the person holding the hammer yeah uh, I don't know if it's significant uh, or not. Well, but it looks like that might be like a ponytail. 
Yeah, well, it definitely is a ponytail at the back, but, but I'm saying yeah. that there's it, he didn't color mm. in the top. So it looks like what, you know, like a Friar Tuck type mm -hmm. of hairdo, which is supposed to be representative of the crown of thor thorns, mm -hmm. right? That's why they did that. That's why they shaved the top of their head as gotcha. unity with Christ. Um, but also that, you know, the, the king himself, right? Like Jesus, that you're saying I'm part of his, his group, right? That that's why right. they did it. Um, yeah. So anyway, so you have that. Then you have this person holding a hammer. So very much like Jesus was a carpenter, but mm -hmm. also to construct the cross. So it has a double meaning there. Mm. And then I can't tell what that kid is holding. I honestly don't know. Uh, I think that might be the deck of cards. I was going to say, I think that it's a deck of cards. And I don't know what to make of that at all. But then the other guy is carrying the propeller, but it's very much, you know, you know, pick up your cross and follow me. Right. It looks yeah. like a cross, which is physically pick up your cross and follow me. Right. So it's yeah. saturated, saturated with Christian iconography. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and I was going to mention with the uh, deck of cards, uh, I know that it is mentioned uh, that you shouldn't keep them because uh, yeah, it says that it will lead to it'll inevitably lead to gambling. Yes. Um, so, uh, it, yes. Yeah. So it could be, you know a reference to how gambling had uh, started appearing in the churches. Um, and then, you know, Jesus came in and tossed over the tables. Um, and he was just like, this is, you know, sacrilege. This is, you know, just inappropriate for, uh, <laughs> for a church. I thought that it was the um, people who were... Um... I don't know that it was gambling that he did that with, mm. but anyway, but, uh, but yes, but you are right. Um, because I'm pretty sure that it was people who were, um, like money traders, um, essentially mm. people who were like essentially lending money and then selling, um, cause they would sell things as, as offerings in the synagogue, yeah. but like they were overcharging on that. And they were basically, they had a business set up in church. Right. And it's like, you don't come to church to turn a profit. Yeah. Um, but yes, but definitely the rejection of gambling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely is, is big. So my comment here is that this civilization, this chapter is a totally effed up version of the Garden of Eden. He's so wrong in his understanding of what Eden is. It's kind of staggering how much he misunderstands the Garden of Eden. Um, but it's very much, to me, it's, first you've got all this Christian iconography, which doesn't, I don't know how much significance it's supposed to have, other than there's something biblical going on here. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could uh, try to read into it as ish, you know, coming and converting all these people to... Uh, yeah okay that's that's good that's a good reading of it that he's definitely converting them he's acting as a christ-like figure mm -hmm. um but he's a false um deity yeah right yeah. um but then as far as like my explanation about the garden of eden he is trying to turn this place into a sin-free um civilization a sin-free society and then if you don't want to be part of it then you go to the arboretum where i believe there's only one tree there and it's an apple tree with very bitter apples and then you mm -hmm. take it and then you bite it and then you are essentially exiled from the garden slash island right, right. Yeah. that it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil mm -hmm. right that it is that you've got the, the tree of life and then you've got the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you are not allowed to eat from that tree in the, you know, first few chapters of Genesis. Now yeah. the significance of it though, and this is where I'm saying that he doesn't understand what the garden of Eden actually was. Cause he's saying, get rid of that because it could lead to sin, get rid of the deck of cards because it could lead to gambling, get rid of that because it could lead to this 
sinful behavior, that sinful behavior. We don't need anything. So like we're going to be just a completely stripped down society where we have essentially no possessions, just like in Eden. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what he's trying to do. But the problem and my point here is that it's a complete misunderstanding of why there was no sin in the Garden of Eden. There was no sin in the Garden of Eden because there was no law. Right. And beyond that, there was no knowledge of what was good or what was evil. The fact that he has knowledge of this could be sinful, that can't be sinful, we can yeah. keep this, but we can't keep that, shows that this is not the Garden of Eden. So then to go and take from an apple of this tree, and then you now have knowledge of what is actually good and what is actually evil, and now you are exiled from this island. I'm saying that even if you had something that later on would be used for sinful purposes in the Garden of Eden, because there was no knowledge of what was good or evil, it was impossible to sin. Right. Yep. So... It's like, I don't know if Handler just doesn't know that, or if Ishmael doesn't know that, or if Snicket is not supposed to know this, but it's a totally messed up version of this Edenic, you know, society. That's yeah. not what kept Adam and Eve from sinning. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that is a, that that's a great reading of it. Um, because, yeah, it definitely with all the imagery there and the um yeah the the apple tree although i always hate that people you know depict uh the fruit of the tree of good and evil as an apple like there's nothing that says that it was it's just no, it's just it's a, fruit a, <laughs> to a, draw. a red fleshy fruit is mm. i believe in ancient hebrew that's essentially what it translates to is okay. a red fleshy fruit and you know there's different speculations one is that it's a fruit that no longer exists that was only found in the garden of evil uh, or gar- garden of eden um but I, I've heard before, like my professor in my first year of university, then he suggested that wouldn't it be great if it was a pomegranate? Because a pomegranate um, bleeds red when you mm. eat it. And he's like, to have that on their, on her hands. And then it ends nice. up on Adam's hand. And you can't get rid of it. It's hard to even wash it off. Yeah. Because um, it stains and it stains red. And I'm like, oh, nice. boy, does that ever make sense? <laughs> like, there's still no evidence that it's a pomegranate. Uh, this right. is red fleshy fruit. But it's, uh, yeah, it's it's not an apple. Like, not necessarily an apple. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting. And, again, like, you know, knowing what I know of um of the rest of the book that it's hard for me to say much else um but yeah that the far side of the the island um you know it's it's an interesting concept that everything you know potentially sinful is yeah. being brought over to that side yes uh, by these sheep you know the lamb of god yeah. <laughs> um yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So there's a uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot of religious um, uh, overtones that uh, or or undertones. <laughs> rather, yeah, um, that you know will totally get go right over kids' heads. <laughs> um, first, yeah, yeah, most kids. I think I would have picked up on this mm. stuff as a right. kid but i yeah like with my like upbringing then i was very sensitive right. to these um kinds of things so yeah um but yeah we we will certainly get more of that um <laughs> as it goes on uh and uh, uh as the book goes on and yeah i don't know what else to say other than it ishmael does seem to be attempting to create a heaven on earth um you know for these people protecting them from the evils of the world um but of course this is all a a false eden (laughs) yes exactly and um i it's really surprising to see this in this book and Mm. 
now that we're not at the Hotel Denouement, which is very much where it seemed that the book was going, the series was going to conclude, and now we're in this weird, quasi-religious, Edenic community, but things are not quite right. Um, yeah. And for a series where I have been screaming about the fact that in 12 books, there is no religion at all anywhere <laughs> to be found in this world, right? Yeah. Not that the Baudelaire's have to be religious or just the fact that there's no mention of a single religious person, except a couple of references to rabbis who yeah. don't even know how to read Hebrew. Right. So um, that it's strange that he's playing with this, but, and you're right that it pro like for, almost all kids and it's going to go way over their head they're not going to catch these things mm -hmm. but i still don't know what his point is yeah i i would say uh because i i you know kind of phrased this before as a um uh as you know the the resolution uh uh for the for the series where it's you know just the end that that's it and so if you look at it in terms of, you know, the children have gone on this whole journey and then they arrive in this, you know, heaven place <laughs> that this could, you know, be their kind of afterlife after all their yep. miserable circumstances in life. Then they wind up, uh, you know, here. For so, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is interesting. Okay. Obviously, I think I think that this book in particular, I need to keep reading before I speculate too much further. So, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, all right, yeah, I agree. Th this book is so different from the others, and yeah, I've I've probably read this one more than the others, just because. Well, for one thing, it was the first book that I actually owned mm. uh, in the series, <laughs> right? And uh, but yeah, it's it's very interesting. It's got a lot of yeah interesting stuff going on <laughs> okay well i'm looking forward then to the next four chapters because this is at least interesting stuff mm -hmm. i i don't have a lot of faith in handler to be honest <laughs> right. this is the problem <laughs> yeah <laughs> is it's not even so much like i can, i guess i could say i don't have a lot of faith in snicket but i feel like there's enough of seeing you know the actual wizard of oz behind the curtain mm. right in right. these books where I'm going, I don't think that's a Snicket thing. I think that's a Handler thing. Right. Um, and I, I can't say for sure, but I just I just don't have a lot of faith that he's going to be able to say something. Um, I don't know. To, to take these little bits of religious illusions and do something satisfying with them. Right. I, yeah. I feel like, oh, he's really playing with fire now, is essentially my concern. But I, I, I yeah. could be wrong. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I don't have a, a perfect memory of this either. So, and like, last time that I read it was years ago. So right. I don't remember. Right. That I picked up on all the different themes and everything. Of course, since we've been talking about religion uh, in regards yeah. to these books, we're so... For so long, then it certainly has brought to mind these things uh, a lot right. more. That's yeah, all. absolutely. And yeah. also reading the books in quick succession, too. Yes. Then that does something yeah. as well. Quick succession and then actually having a discussion about each one in detail. We're, you know, we're, we're talking about each book for probably something like three hours for each book. So that you catch yeah. things that you just wouldn't catch if you didn't have somebody to bounce ideas off of. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll leave it there for today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Well, feel free to comment on any, any of the stuff that we talked about. And so for next week, we are looking at chapters five to eight in Book the 13th, The End. All right, folks. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Ignore the tattoo. A phrase here which means like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast across the web. That may seem like a strange definition, but in this context, it is entirely accurate.